as everyone else, uh, I would like to start with thank you to organizers um, and also uh, thank them for presenting me a, with a challenge or presenting again just a year after my talk at the meeting um, in 2014. That's particularly challenging for organization that only produces data for others rather than producing our own data. So I have to entertain you through some other means. Um, I thought that apart from just updating you on sort of technology package, I spent also a few minutes telling you how we deliver the technology and um, tell you a bit more about how we operate as an organization. Uh, we are slightly unusual animal, you may say. Um, and in a snapshot, I'd like to start with the mission statement where, where we put ourselves for um, more uh, contributing to more effective and sustainable use of natural resources. So it's a very broad, very broad mission statement. Whatever method, technology approaches would uh, work, um, would be quite pleased. So that's an easy way out. But our main business is um, genome profiling services uh, and also information technology support for agriculture because as, as Jason indicated in the early morning session that um, agriculture is the one that is draining uh, predominantly our natural resources and, and questionable sustainability in, in positions. Uh, so we're operating since 2001. Uh, we were, in my view, first affordable whole genome providing service um, in, in crops. We are global service providers. Um, if you look uh, at the map of our clients, it's uh, quite quite a um, broad range, over 40 countries. Um, we work with over 180 organisms. Um, we're also supporting international agriculture through both training and service provision. I'll mention it in the course of, the, of, of this um, presentation. Um, we also deliver a whole technology package uh, to organizations um, in several geographies. We have a small team, uh, just under 30 people, but um, Compared to BGI, if you scale it to a population size of Australia, where we are based, is about right. Um, we, we have a, a very high diversity of, of clients. Uh, we work with farmers to uh, send their uh, seed to us for genetic identification and purity testing. We work with a lot of uh, breeding and seed companies. Uh, we work with um, uh, public institutions and, and uh, corporations. Um, the main point is that this high diversity of clients imposes on us um, diver diversity of solutions because each client comes with their very specific needs. And let me also point to the, the team, some pictures, a collage of, of, of our teams. So those are the people who actually uh, contribute to, to our, our service. Um, it's a bit dark here, so I'm clicking at random. Let me try to do a bit better, okay. So I put it in inverted commas because um, you, those who understand our organization and better would appreciate that we are much more a social enterprise than, than a traditional uh, corporations. Um, and I, as a, as a um, um, pro, let's say, owner of a company, I'm a bit unusual um, in the sense that I never imagined myself doing uh, business. Um, I spent first 20 some years of my career uh, in academia and non-for-profit uh, private research organizations. So it was uh, somewhat challenging to realize that no one uh, wanted to pick up the technology that I invented some um, 17 years ago, uh, mostly because technology was not available for exclusive licensing. Therefore, with some initial support from Australian Biotechnology Innovation Fund, I had to jump the fence in a way. and. Um, with a s small team uh, who um, who took uh, this on board. We, we started our operations, um, then support with Grains R&D Corporations from Australia and other R&D Corporations was very helpful for us to grow our capacity and services. The main point um, behind our low cost of our service is the fact that we have near legal zero and promotional expenses. Uh, we never advertise our work and our service all is distributed through the word of mouth. We pride ourselves on this fact um, because that indicates that we do have some relevance to people um, and people are happy with what we do. 
Um, a lot of initial technology development was through fairly large consortia of very small players. Uh, so again, we, we were helping this community, organ organizing community and delivering technology for these, for these communities. And we very often support clients at the market, in the market failure um, space. So we have, we call it open access technology uh, delivery concept, and we see ourselves engaging in, in partnerships with um, predominantly large public institutions involved in international agriculture. Something that I often call that network. Uh, there are a couple of um, covers of the two books, both came out in 1999. This was shortly after, after DART was invented, and uh, they provided a lot of uh, inspiration, my, my, especially the book by uh, D. Hogg, he was the uh, um, director of the Seattle First Bank, so you very rarely get inspired by a banker, but this guy was special. He came up with the concept of chaotic organizations, and chaotic means chaos and order combined. So interface between those two phases, some, uh, the area that is claimed to be uh, the center of um, creativity and uh, um, growth. Uh, he was uh, also the first president of Visa International, so this is a part of my credit card. You can see the Visa logo. Um, so this guy, you know, he invented Visa concept and, and um, evolved it or helped to develop this organization to multi-trillion dollar operations. I never had big ambitions on, on us um, being a money-making operations in that sense, but there are certain uh, interesting thing about Dehock's concept that I wanted to share with you. Uh, but I also wanted to mention the book by CEO of Red Hat, a company who develops you know, a business model for open so, uh, doing open source uh, software development, yet doing it in a sustainable and, and uh, manner through delivery of services rather than selling the code. So just one last sort of philosophical uh, slide, just to give you an introduction to this chaotic organization concept. Um, for me, what was inspirational about, about De Hogg was that he really thought about evolution and biology much more than a lot of my colleagues in molecular biology. He, he understood the holistic nature, uh, self-organization, um, emergent features of the complex systems uh, as I said, much, uh, much better than many of us uh, in biology. Uh, you can go through it quickly. I just wanted to point a couple of, of, of these uh, modified teachings from DHOC, harmoniously combine cooperation and competition. And I think that it's very important that in our business dealings, we very often, at least in the last 100 years or 200 years, we were focusing on competition as a driver uh, and thinking that this is like evolution is happening. But when we reflect on evolution a bit more deeply, we recognize that this phenomenon of cooperation that makes ecosystems working. And I think that we are maybe not too far from this realization and changing our business models a little bit more to incorporate cooperation as a significant component of our marketplace activity. Okay, so how you <laughs> deal with this um, concepts uh, and how do you propagate this kind of thinking that is still far from being mainstream. One of the ways is just brainwash people and one of the good ways of brainwashing is to bring them over and uh, caffeinate them in the coffee room, uh, drink beer with them in the evening or whatever technology you apply, but the important thing is to bring people to your, to your place and we're doing it substantially through a training process. Uh, we had well over 100 visitors to our company. Uh, most of them, just short term, they would spend a week, two, or maybe a month. But, uh, and, and this is mostly bring your material, your DNA, get the data, the downstream analysis. But there is also a large group, over 20 people, who came to us for extended period of time, from several months to, to several years. And most of these uh, people, come to us in the context of technology transfer. Um, they develop competence in performing all relevant tasks in, in running our technology. Um, we look 
for, in them for some ability to specialize, but we, we are particularly pleased to have those generalists that could do web science, but also do some data analysis, and in particular, in particular if they have also some IT skills. Part of this uh, training, as I said, is to deliver the technology to other geographies and other environments. Um, uh, so the, the saga of saga that uh, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, unfortunately I could not be yesterday, so I'm not sure if, if um, uh, Sarah Khan was able to mention um, our effort in transferring this technology to Mexico, but um, the, I'm sure that she talked about seed projects, so you're aware of that. And we, when seed project was at the initial stages, we thought that delivering the capacity to do this kind of analysis in Mexico by Mexicans would be a good thing and uh, form sort of legacy of this project. Um, we had um, agreement with CIMIT and support from Mexican government. Um, we started with existing demand. There was a um, over 100,000 samples to process, so it looked like there is, there is some need for high throughput genotyping. Uh, we also built capacity. We trained nine of the of the nine students, um, and we provided a complete uh, package of this technology to Saga. If you if you're searching for Saga, this is what may came up in a search, which is an interesting couple. Um, I've never seen this. Uh, this movie, but but I wanted to point to do to this couple, Caroline and Cesar. Those are the people who are actually operating Saga after spending three years initially in our company, uh, doing some um, pioneering work on eucalyptus, uh, especially on genomic selection. Um, so the the main the main thing is that uh, we're still working on sort of a business model to push the capacity that Saga represents beyond. Uh, seed project requirements, and I, I took a lot of learnings from from this activity from Saga. How to install um, our platform at Becca? I'm not sure again whether Apollinar mentioned um, our plans, but we'll be training 15 Africans um, this year in order to establish this platform uh, at, at Becca. One of the biggest learnings, and hopefully not affecting us, is that change of the government of the country can have a tremendous impact and very, really positive. So now, moving to our technology package, and increasingly over over years, I started looking at, at, at the organization, and our organization at least, as the data or information flow diagrams rather than, than machines or, or anything else. So, so that's a pretty complex picture, but, but I wanted to point to a few major issues that you want to uh, spend some time on. That DB domain that is on the left is all our data production, DNA processing or sample processing activity. Faded out is data integration platform. So we started with that DB at the beginning of the company. We started with creating this that data management system that had uh, a few important elements. Um, it's a database, but it's also a laboratory information management system. It's connected to online ordering system and some other tools. It also, but, but you know, after a few years of producing fairly high volume of data for, for our users, we realized that only a small fraction of this data can be absorbed and effectively used. So increasingly, we realized that we need to help our clients with data analysis. We built some analytical tools, or took some of the shelf, some developed um, with, in partnership with other uh, people competent in these type of technologies. And we developed this uh, analytical platform that allowed us to not only do DNA profiling, but also help people with data analysis. This capability is now embedded in a software called KD Compute. And I'll talk about it a bit later. Um, but, but soon enough, we realized that the data, the phenotypic data coming to us, is of questionable quality. So we developed the whole KD Dart system to deal with all other types of data management system that was clearly lagging or lacking completely in our clients. So very quickly about DubDB, it's a 
marker and sequence production and storage system. I mentioned already that it's uh, integrating online with online ordering system and, and LIMS. Um, it's integrating the data storage with sequencers, um, also with imaging systems, pipetting robots, so all the robotics management uh, processes. We store data from the first image produced uh, some 13 or 14 years ago from the arrays. All the raw data is stored by our company. And, and uh, we simply uh, use this analytic process to drive reduction in the volume of data that we have to store. And the DartDB grew very well over the last, over a decade, coping with between two to four fold the yearly increases in sample data volume. Here is not the volume of data, but the increasing number of organisms that we added to DartDB. So that's from 2003, you can see fairly stable and gentle increase, but when we started talking to people in ecology and animal science, that was a, from the last two years, there was rapid explosion, um, at least by our standards, we added uh, nearly 100 organisms in the last two years, and this is still growing. So very rapid adoption of this technology for ecology, mostly animal systems, uh, fisheries, and, and other, other animal uh, systems. So DartSoft 14, oh, sorry. DartSoft 14 is our data analysis for market data production. Has, we build a completely novel mar marker calling algorithms. Uh, it calls SNPs and uh, Slico darts, a lot of metadata. Um, we do alignment to model genome, but, but only a few percent of nearly 200 organisms have any reputable genome at the moment. Um, it, it is put into a stable framework, but algorithm evolves every, nearly every week. So we have very rapid progress in how to extract more useful and better quality data from the sequences. It's very fast and efficient. We can process thousands, tens of thousands of samples within a day. Last or This week we're actually running over 75,000 libraries of wheat from the seed project as a single process. We also have a system on optimizing multiplex level that is up, up most appropriate for the particular asset. So very briefly, what this DartSec is, and a number of people mentioned uh, uh, this technology uh, during this meeting, but let me just briefly uh, talk about it, that it actually, in, in, it has 17 years of technology development that is embedded, mostly on how you reduce complexity of the genome to get low copy uh, genome fractions. And um, it involves more or less about 200,000 mostly low copy sequences selecting from the whole genome through metal filtration. Uh, most of these assays are read at, at significant depth. This is a sort of an average of the uh, last 30 or, or, or so services. And so this is the number of SNPs or darts that we produce or read depth for these relevant market types you can see very high reproducibility and call rate. And this reproducibility is measured and tested uh, very vigorously through a technical replication. All quality is also due to very extensive quality control processes that are embedded. And it's also sequencing platform independent. We changed several different sequencing platforms already and we are ready for, for more. Um, so there are just a range of different applications. I'll go through it very quickly because um, we had a few examples provided by other people. So maybe things that were not talked about, uh, seed purity and product quality testing. That's maybe not part of breeding, but absolutely critical component of delivery of seed to the farmer. And uh, not only we established this technology for Australian uh, farmers, but uh, last, in the last two years we worked uh, in a project involving um, Gates Foundation investment to, to, to identify crop varieties that are grown in, in, in uh, places like Ethiopia. Um, we've done a lot of genetic and, uh, and QTL mapping. We produce well over 1,000 mapping populations. The point I would make here is, for example, 500 of those maps were in wheat, and what we are finding is not the genome size that is a problem mapping in wheat, but very high level of structural diversity among the, the parents. Therefore, 
our consensus map that has right now close to 100,000 markers is a product of very efficient filtering of this structural variability. So genomic selection is our very significant uh, service provision for the breeder, but we, as I said earlier, this is only breeding focus. We have a lot of, a lot of population genetics and genomics, uh, population genomics applications as well. The, the, whenever you're considering technology or a platform for your work, you need to understand the size and demand for a particular application. For us, as a relatively small organization, we're trying to limit the number of platforms, so lowering investment, um, and we're really using practically only sequencing platform as a best bet. Um, but we allow for quite a range of assay densities, from hundreds of thousands for parental lines to thousands for routine selections. It also, this density allows you to not only impute a full data set but also impute all the way to the uh, full sequence if you have uh, resequencing data. Uh, but we also have a cheaper version of the assays. We either just read at lower depths and, and use imputation or capture a subset of fragments. Um, and the fact that we are using markers that are selected from representation allows for much more efficient imputation. Lately, we were stretched by a request from some of our clients to do some of the resequencing work, uh, but also lower marker density work. Unfortunately, I realized that I'm running short of time, and I wanted to talk to you about something that is by far more important than, than just genotyping. As many people said, genotyping is almost sorted out, although the cost, as you know, vary. But, but the data integration is the crux of the matter, and we spent um, at least last six years focusing developing capacity and technologies to deal with this issue. And what is the issue? It's really about integrating three types of data. Environmental data, and many people said that it's important, but I have to say that in terms of data integration, I don't see any platform that is available for readers that would really use the environmental data uh, or capture environment data in any efficient way and store it and, and use it. So the environmental data would come either public geographic data or local captured by sensors, weather stations, what have you. Uh, phenotypic data captured by varieties of, of, of systems, and I think that uh, Pat's presentation uh, earlier in the session was quite clear um, you, uh, about different options that, that, that you may have. Um, interestingly, in our system, all these machines would be registered as the users of the database, and they could transfer the data through the data access layer automatically without any human intervention. So they can communicate remotely with the central data storage system. So phenotypic data can be collected, as I said, in a number of ways, including the handheld devices or whatever technology you apply. We also connected quite efficient analytics process, data management process, and end molecular data. I'm sorry that it looks quite technical, but I think it's an imp just to make a few small points. First, that most people in at the audience would appreciate the systems looking at the application layer, meaning what do you see when you switched on your computer. So we have a number of applications that have been developed in the last couple of years, but we spent most of the last six years developing the, the proper architecture of the system. Mostly data access layer, which is application programming interface, and also redeveloping schema of, for the phenotypic component that we inherited from, from the older system developed in Australia, but adding to it genotypic and environmental modules. So data access layer is a really critical element because it, can, it controls all access to KDDAT system, uh, so all the data flows in and out through DAO. It ensures, therefore, data integrity help to create user interfaces with any type of uh, language that, that you have uh, skills in, can service as a self, software as a serv service. Uh, it has a lot of different protocols that, that you can get data through. It's very, uh, very well developed, a complete uh, in, in package. And also, we open sourced it recently. 
and we're also developing interoperable version um, to enable more effective interactions between KDDART and other data management systems. So just very quickly, KD Smart is data collection device, uh, an Android application. Uh, it can synchronize directly to KD Dart and go through the KD Explorer, which is um, data quality control uh, tool um, for data curation. It can work online and offline. It accepts data for KD um, Smart. Can do a lot of visualization um, of data, and as I said, mostly for data curation. It's also useful for software developers, but we don't have to, time to talk about that. KD Compute, I mentioned in the, in the past that it is uh, used for our market data production, but we also created a, a very significant range of um, algorithms that work in this framework for either uh, mapping or consensus mapping, uh, GWAS, genomic selection, breeding statistics, METAR, and many other things. So this, this is the same platform. It uses, uh, it can use either DartDB, KDDart as the database storage, but also file system. KDMAN is an online syst uh, system for data management. It's a web application uh, for setup and uh, administration, day-to-day -day administration, um, including site and trial management, journal management, market data management, and so on. So as I'm running out of uh, water in my system. I'm very dehydrated after arriving early this morning. So let me run through the conclusions very quickly. Uh, we have integrated DNA profiling and IT services uh, to, for the benefit of our clients um, for nearly 200 organisms. The DAMSEC is a generic, scalable, and fairly robust platform for any organism and application. Um, we also were pushed to the, um, engaging lower densities um, that I didn't have a chance to talk uh, with, with you today, but, but it's something that, that we're working intensely. Uh, DartDB and DartSoft are main platforms for market data productions. Uh, KDDart platform is really uh, a unique platform for integrating all kinds of data from environment uh, phenotypes to, to uh, molecular data. And the RESTful API platform uh, and user interfaces provide an environment where other organizations or, 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 or people can contribute to development of this platform. And I hope that you understand slightly better our open access and uh, partnership model for technology and service delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Killian, for a very comprehensive presentation much beyond, you know, whatever we had thought about the, the very comprehensive activities of your DART platform. So the topic is open for discussion, for comments. Please. And on the mic. Thank you for your nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question about DART. The DART is a Co-dominant or a dominant market? Okay, it's a quite a basic and important question. It, the, the DART, um, uh, the DART that we developed um, in um, quite some time ago, it's actually nine, uh, probably 97 or 98, where the first experiments were run. So that was in, indeed a do dominant market system. So we are scoring uh, either presence or absence of a fragment in genomic representation. However, DART seek, which is which is um, a, a new implementation of the, of the concept of um, genome complexity reduction method followed by some kind of readout. So when you change the readout from hybridization, where you can't discriminate, at least not very effectively, discriminate heterozygous, we, we can do some discrimination for heterozygosity on the array as well, but, but predominantly we were scoring our markers in dominant fashion. When you have SNPs uh, in a that seek platform, we look for two types of markers. One is presence, absence of a fragment in genomic representation. It's exactly like the old markers, but we discover them in silico. That's why we call silico DART. But the other type of marker is SNP, and they are the same SNP type of marker as any other SNP on other platforms. Yeah, so they are fully dom codominant, sorry.
Thank you. Um, thanks, Sanjay. The, in listening to, to you and, and other service providers uh, over the past couple of days and in conversation, um, I've learned a lot about um, how important uh, it is for the, the clients of a service to be good clients. <laughs> Define uh, good. In, in terms of, uh, you know, providing samples and uh, in a, uh, a way that, uh, and, and defining their problems in a way that ma it makes, makes it efficient to, to serve them uh, and therefore cost effective. How much time and effort do you have to put into training your clients uh, <laughs> to, to actually um, provide you with, with, with uh, samples, with data that uh, allow you to serve them? An excellent question, but um, probably a one minute answer won't, won't do it justice, so I'm happy to continue over coffee or, or beer. But, but you know, we have a very simple method of, of training our, our clients that if the DNA comes with insufficient quality, we simply don't do. We, we spend a lot of time trying to, to work with suboptimal quality. Our technology is very robust in terms of tolerating even five or seven fold differences in the concentration. It works with phenomenally degraded samples, especially on a dad seek. M m most of these fragments are really around 100 bases, so we can have very degraded DNA and it'll still work. However, it has to be free from some major inhibitors of the enzymes that we're putting in the reaction. So, so in a way, uh, our quality control is a two-step. We first check DNA and, and, and we don't reject. In the past, we were rejecting just based on looks, and we realized that <laughs> That, that we can do a lot with very nasty looking DNA. So we, do to the, we go to the next step, we produce the, the targets or libraries, um, as you would call it, and then only if we, can't, if we know that we can't produce the data, we, we provide a report to people which samples would not pass, and our clients can, can say, do those that, that can work, or I will resubmit, or I will resubmit only those that did not work. Yeah? So there's a variety of, of um, interactions. One of the biggest components of our cost structure would be dealing with this aspect of, of the client. So training better clients is important, but you, as you know, clients are always right, so you can't teach them how to do better, you know? So that's, I'll continue after that. Any other questions? Sorry. <laughs>